I grabbed the gun. He said, wait, that's the guy that makes Biggie Smalls beat. I was gonna say, look out, Wiz. <laughs> Nah, he told the story how Stout came up in here like he owned the place, man. He about to get aired out. Safe to say that shit is different. It's different now. Much. Safe to say that shit is different. You asked me, how'd you first meet Nas? Everyone wanted to work with him, but no one could find him. My job was to find them, and I ran into these guys. Right. Yeah, and it didn't start off so healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? So take him through the story. Where were we? And this is the corner where Nas took the picture of Illmatic. This is the, the same corner that he's looking at. Okay. In, in, the, in the picture where his face is a little kid. And this is that corner. We sold, you know, man, mad crack on this corner. This was a legendary corner. People went to jail, fought, shot to death, robberies. Everything happened right here where we're walking right. now. So Stout parked like right here. And he got out the car and it was like a walk, you can walk through the grass? This gate wasn't here? Nah, the gate, yeah, the gate wasn't, wasn't here. here. The you gate wasn't no here. Gate yet being but there. you can walk through this grass or walk around. Since he cut through the grass, that meant he was aggressive. You know what I mean? That meant he might be coming to rob us. We sitting on the benches now. <laughs> so you pulled up like you knew, like you supposed to be here. He's pulling up like he fucking <laughs> like he like he here. This is a nice neighborhood to pull up and just <laughs> ask, hey, hey, do you know where Nas here and Nas is and shit? Bro, how you roll There's up in somebody else's hood? You don't know nobody. There's no one really... to call. What were you supposed to do? Call? Who do you call? <laughs> and now he pulls over. Now my heart starts beating. I'm like, for real? He's pulling over. He must. He must want this shit. <laughs> so now I'm like, yo, you know, I sat down. Boom, boom. The gun is down there. You know what I mean? I'm like, all right, what is he going to do? He got out that car and cut through the grass. I grabbed the gun. I said, yo, everybody look out. And Wiz said, no. <laughs> he said, wait, that's the guy that makes Biggie Smalls beats. He made one more chance. He's looking for Nas. He made one more chance for Biggie. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? You, you went over there and talked to him in the middle and you told me to chill and if you wasn't there, bro, you know what I mean? It would have been nuts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I'm in the pitch. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Steve Stout. He said, yo, I'm just looking for Nas. I want to manage him. He said, I don't want to see him with mad skills and not making no money behind their skills. He said, I'm here to change that. He said, I want to talk to Nas. I said, Joe. Hell yeah. <laughs> 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 I was gonna say, look out, Wiz. <laughs> nah, I was gonna definitely hear you, though. <laughs> we, appreciate, we appreciate that. We appreciate now, that. We appreciate you once not taking man, my life. This is one of my yeah, best friends cool. I ever had in my life. Yeah. I love him so much. Yeah. We've been through mad shit. This is not his brother. I don't know if you picked up on all that. A real talk. Yeah. No, that's his brother. Hey, I don't live out here no more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down there rich too. You don't see me. Yeah. 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 Me forever, you know, but yeah, yeah, you don't know. Sure. Some little nigga might, you know. Right. I was young, I was pressing anybody. Right. It's Christmas, mom. It's, 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 it's December. You don't know what kind of, it's, the, it's the hood, you know what I mean? It's the project. You can't predict the projects, but right, right. this is where I'm from. I lived, I lived in that building over there, you know. Grew up out here and everything, but I'm gone now. <laughs> Shannon, I'm gone, Shannon. Okay. That's what's up. That's what's up. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> You already know my style outside. You know I'm outside. You know, you know where we are. You know I'm outside, boy. <laughs> what up, bro? Yes, sir. What's up, dude? I'm doing great, man. I'm out here with your brother, with people from the bridge, bro. That's what's up, man. I love for you, y'all. I appreciate that. I told Shannon Sharp where they used to tackle you at over there. Over there. When they was hurting, they was tackling you. Mo Rooney, Mo Rooney and Mayo was tackling you so hard over there, man. Shit was crazy, man. They made you cry, man. Nah, he told a story how uh, Pat Stout came up in here like he owned the place, man. He about to get aired out. He asked a lot of questions about us early in the beginning, and I really said a lot of it stemmed from how we met. Just. You knew what I was, you know, my determination, and that determination led to a friendship that's lasted 28 years. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the brother I, I always wanted to <laughs>
Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, it really, it really, really talked to me and got me on the um, got me focused, man. So I always appreciate you, Steve. It's amazing that y'all went out there. I can't believe. I can't believe fucking Shannon Sharp is right here. <laughs> you a real one for that, Shannon. Oh, man, I know Shannon. Hey. Shannon is a real one, right? Hey, here. hey, bro. The people they love Unk. They will holler when I got out of the truck. They're like, hey, man, that's Unk. <laughs> nah, they love you out here. Hell yeah. So I'm good. Hell yeah. They saw you winning them Super Bowls and shit out here. I appreciate you that, crazy. man. You may end up in a verse now. <laughs> all my life, the grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice? Got to roll the dice. That's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Yeah. All my life. Grinding all my life, sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Bro, man. Man, we got you in Brooklyn, man. Thank you, bro. Uh, uh, yeah. Love. Summertime shy on the boat, me and the guys plotting our next moves, putting smoke This is uh, a lot of the awards we had won. That's the Jay Z sneaker, right? Joint. Yeah, Jay Z oh, sneaker yeah. we okay. did. Those are the Pharrells, the original ice creams. Mm, wow. He did those. It's mostly advertising awards. And you got the billboards Some up there. Some billboards, yeah, maybe we got, look, maybe we got some hardware, man. You know, <laughs> we, 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 we've done a good job. Right. This is where it really took off for me, Shannon. Right. Um, you know, I did the Men in Black soundtrack. Right. That was great. That was like a Will Smith comeback album because mm -hmm. music changed on a Wu Tang, Biggie, Nas, that came in mm -hmm. and sort of like happy rap right. was kind of off to the, the sides. Yeah. And then, because, but Will was a movie star and we made Men in Black and the song went crazy. It changed his music career, right. got him back. But the thing about this that was nuts is that the album sold 10 million, but the glasses sold more. Wow. And we never got paid from the glasses. And the small advertising agency that did the product placement for the glasses, I spent time with them. And literally over the next three years, I left the music business and got into advertising. That's how I got into advertising. Because wow. I'm like, if you could, if, you, if the music could sell all these glasses, imagine what I could do if I left the music business mm -hmm. and focused on the product. And that's why I made the Jay-Z sneaker and the Pharrell sneaker and the G-Unit sneakers. I started trying to make products because I thought that we could use the music, and that's where, that's kind of where we are right. today. But I was back on that uh, super so early. You so doing the, you was doing the collab before the collab was cool. It wasn't even a collab. It was, <laughs> we, it was more, it was to me, it was obvious, man. Like, if you can move culture and you can move people, why wouldn't you sell higher margin items? Right. Like, it's, you could sell a CD for sixteen ninety nine. You could sell a sneaker for one hundred and ten dollars. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. You could move, right. Will Smith was selling those glasses. He didn't get paid from the glasses either. When Will Smith said, "I make these look good," those glasses was gone. He's a very innovative businessman, founder and CEO, a music industry vet, a multi-talented marketing genius, an industry leader and entrepreneur, award-winning record producer and advertising exec, artist manager, New York Times best-selling author. You were inducted into the Advertising Hall of Fame Achievement, recognized as Ad Color Awards, Innovator of the Year, named Executive of the Year by Ad Age, has one of the fastest growing companies, most creative people in business, a guru, game changer, icon, trailblazer, visionary, known as the commissioner. He has the golden touch. Steve, stop. I love that intro. Uh, I love that intro. Did I leave out anything? Because, no, man, not, my uh, resources are not, man. man that was good. No, you're good. You're good, man. I, I feel like, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, man, could he add a little bit more to that? But, no. Nah, I, I mean, we could add a little bit more season, but we, nah, that's we don't want to over-season it. No, nah, it was season perfect. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't know how many people know this, but Kobe lived with you for six weeks. Yeah. How old was he when he lived with you? How old was he? He was going into his second year. So he's about 18. Yeah. Yeah. And you said, is it true that you signed Kobe to a, a recording contract? Uh, yeah, I signed Kobe to a recording contract. So to do the, what? The math went just like this. Okay. Right? Yeah, I would hear this one. Let me tell you for this one. When Will Smith made Men in Black and sold all these records, mm -hmm. the music business had changed where it was like, you know, it was, again, Nas, 
Wu Tang and, and 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 Biggie and sort of Mob Deep. It was that kind of you know much darker yeah. sound. Yes, right compared to what he was doing. Right, uh, he was bright as bright can get. Right. You talking about Will or Will. Kobe? I'm talking about Will. 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 I'm talking about Will right now. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm like, if this guy, and he rapped over a sample, and it became super pop and successful, I'm like, if we can do that, just maybe, but well, hold on, Shaq just did it. Shaq sold millions of records, man. Correct. People, like, he really did. Yes. It is not a fake thing. Right. Shaq had a successful recording music career. And I'm like, if Shaq can do it, Will Smith did it, big, Shaq just did it, this kid, Kobe, people will love this guy. I mean, he went to the prom with Brandy. There was a lot of energy around him. And he actually had a rap group. He, when I signed him, he was in a group. I mean, you know, Kobe, God bless. Anyway, he went solo soon after. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, Kobe did uh, yeah. <laughs> He was in a group, though. Yeah. He was in a group, and um, he put in the work. He came to my house. He lived at my house for six weeks. I lived in New Jersey. Um, a very dear friend of mine, uh, Charles Oakley, came out, used to come out to Jersey and hang out with him, worked out with him a few times. And Kobe was the, you know, we in the morning, get up. I got him to go to this local gym. He would shoot a thousand shots. Um, then he would, he had these tapes. Um, it was Michael Jordan going left, Michael Jordan going right. So it was just the tapes were split of Jordan moving left, Jordan moving right, Jordan guarding people going left. Jordan guarding people going right. And he'd watch it for hours. And then we would go to the studio and record. That was his routine uh, every single day. I learned a lot of discipline, uh, the discipline uh, from a young man. I thought I was, you know, I thought I was pretty de uh, disciplined and doing my thing. And then I seen another level of it uh, with him. Very, very special talent. I could, I could talk about him for, for hours because um, during that period of time when I got to know him, he wasn't really into having a lot of friends. A lot of people never got a chance to get deep in, in, in get a chance to get close to him because he was he was closed off like that. And um, for years, man, I we we would we would we would speak all the time. I mean, we, we became very very close friends. Um, so obviously, it was unfortunate. I took him to Rucker Park. He played in Rucker Park, man, <laughs> and uh, he wanted to play because all these guys go out to all these NBA guys go to Rucker Park. It's like you know you got to play in the Rucker. It's like a rite of passage. Yeah. And we go out there. Um, and I gave him to my man. Uh, I didn't have a team. I, I, Irv Gotti grew up in my neighborhood. I let him play for Irv's Murder Inc. team at the time. And he goes out there and all the guys are there. And he starts putting on a show, Shannon. A show. He loved it. <laughs> it starts to drizzle. I'm like, we got to close this game down. I mean, I'm not letting him play, but he's not going to let the game, he's not going to want to be the one to call it. So he starts telling the basketball team how to play on wet surfaces. Wow. Pick, I'm like, we're not doing any of this. Because I already know this man gets hurt. It's, it's on, on me. Watch. It's on my watch. <laughs> uh, so we shut it down. But uh, yeah, he put, I forgot, but he put, he's got 30 points in, you know, 12 minutes or some yeah. crazy number and shit like that. Um so could you tell, because you said he's so disciplined, he's watching Jordan go left, watching Jordan go right. Jordan's garden left, Jordan's garden right. Mm -hmm. And he's back in the studio recording. Did you knew, Did you know then, with the level of discipline that an 18-year-old kid had, that he was going to be what he became? Oakley told me. Charles told me. Charles, Charles told me immediately the similarities between him and Jordan as a, with work ethic. He, he knew it immediately. Not, like he came in talking that I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> he said that. But the other thing he did was he asked me, um, and I had this guy who worked for me uh, at the time. He's actually now, his name is Anton Marchand. He's actually uh, recruits for the Cleveland Cavaliers. He mm -hmm. worked for me in the music business at the time. Kobe was going to go out Allen Iverson that year. And he was very much respectful of Iverson's speed and all mm -hmm. that. And he said, go get, he wanted to get young guards from New York that could, you know, do their thing. Cross over and Cross over and all that. We got him. Went to this indoor gym. He lined 10 of them up. They came in from the three-point line. He stood at the foul line. And they would come in like an assembly line. And he would guard them, try to strip them, take them to the hole, and then run back to the line before the next guy came. He ran that. He never got on offense. He ran that like, a, like an assembly line. 
Wow. He was just guarding. He was guarding guys. Six foot, fast as shit. They'd get past them, steal from them, block it, you know, uh, 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 rub their shit against the backboard, come back, guard the next guy. He was doing this over. I couldn't believe that he was doing this. No offense, no nothing. And it was like, this level of discipline and in a, and in a, a, a tough guy, tough, like it's a strong, disciplined, tough, principle driven man. We are one night, um, to this bar. And back then, street guys would buy all of the Cristal. Yeah. Right. But let me tell you something. They're buying the Cristal because what they want is assuming, not because they are drinking all of it. If somebody comes in, they want to, and you order Cristal, you got to check yeah. in. You got to check in. So I ordered the Cristal. He's not even drinking. Kobe's not drinking at all back then. He was not drinking alcohol at that time. Guy says, I have to check in. This guy down at the bar or whatever. I'm like, I don't feel like doing it. He's like, man, fuck this. It's just a good thing. So I got the Cristal. No, I didn't get the Cristal. I didn't want to do it. I'm like, I'm not, fuck this. I'm not doing this. We go out to a di diner like two, three in the morning. And the same guy, street guy, won't say his name, is sitting there and Cole is making jokes about his outfit and he's being a little loud. I'm like, yeah, you gotta chill with that, bro. Yeah, he's not chilling with that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> he's loud. The guy send somebody over, yo, blah, 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 I want to talk to you. I go outside. I'm like, yo, the young kid, he got the gun out. He's like, yo, the, he got the gun out. Yo, I'm like, yo, he's he's a young man. Da, 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 da. I'm trying to tell him. That's how, no one, he didn't even know who he was. All right? So he didn't even know who Kobe Bryant is. I'm like, he's a, a young man thing. He's cool, whatever, whatever. Kobe comes outside, sees the gun. I'm like, go, go back in. He goes, I'm not going nowhere. He did this on 23rd and 9th Avenue. He did that. So what did old boy At say? 18. The whole thing, I, it, it died. When he said he ain't going nowhere, I'm like, yo, he's just thing. He don't know who you are. I was already, it was already, the guy felt embarrassed. Right. It wasn't like, it wasn't crazy. He, the guy felt embarrassed. He really wanted an apology for the embarrassment. Right. That was, because it was loud. Right. And I was giving him that, it's cool, man. It's fine. He didn't mean no disrespect. He doesn't even know who you are, man. Right. He's not even from here. Right. When he hit the thing out, when he said, I ain't going nowhere, I'm like, dude, what kind of person is this? I'm giving you the out. Right. This is not your problem. I'll deal with this problem. Right. He don't want that. This is our problem. Wow. Man. That's, I never told that story, man. So what? I mean, so you knowing that the kid is so disparate, know that he's standing, as they say now, in business. What? What did he teach you? You can run through walls, man. You believe it, you can do anything. There's nothing you can't do that you that if you believe in it. That's what he taught me. He never... Did he speak about the basketball aspect? I understand he was there to do music, but he did he talk to you about what he wanted to become in the Oh, yeah. hell yeah, man. He had no... He manifested all of it, but he really did the work. He... He knew that if you did all the work, that ultimately it was going to happen. He didn't even think about it. He, all his whole thing was that everybody who has a talent always tapped out in doing the work. I asked him one time. We were at a we were at a um, a restaurant, and we're sitting there talking. And I, and I just and I always wanted to ask this question. Do what do you think about athletes that come from? I would ask you this, man. Athletes that come from two parent households versus athletes that come from single parent households. So you got these guys who come from single parent households. They're in a the football field and their anger and the shit that they, I'm doing this for my mother. I ain't got no father. Whatever the circumstances are, they bring in all that energy on the basketball court, on the football field and they play with that level of rage. Yeah. And he goes, I said, how do you feel about them versus, he goes, you know, those guys are intimidating and they play with that rage and it works until they run into the real thing. Michael Jordan, me, Magic Johnson, they run into that. And we got the same level of work ethic, 
and rage. But we have, we come from a solid foundation. And that solid foundation, that's the, well, that's the thing that those guys can't beat. He said that to me. I was like, all right. Wow. You also <laughs> knew LeBron. At yeah. a very young age. I mean, LeBron was what, like 15, 16 when you met him? I, know, I met LeBron when he was 17. I pitched LeBron. I, the, 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 the whole story about LeBron and the $10 million check that he turned down, yes. I was there. I'm, it was my idea to give him the check. I was in the room give, to give him the check. A kid with a single mom. I couldn't believe it. Living in an apartment. Yeah. And you got a $10 million check. So That's here you right. go, bro. Paul Feynman. So I tell Paul Feynman, I'm like, we leave. We're in New York for meetings. We're flying up to... Uh, Massachusetts to meet LeBron. He's flying in he, the plane. From yeah, from Akron. It's like a six o'clock, five thirty meeting. He, he had to finish school to come to okay. me. Boom. I'm like Paul. He goes, Adidas is going to do the deal. Nike's going to do the deal. He wants to go to Nike. His agent has already pre-approved the deal with Nike. I'm like, let me tell you how you deal with this. In the record business, when you want to sign somebody, you give them the money right there in the front. Like, you know what? Whatever you think the number is. We'll give you this signing bonus right now to not even take the other meetings. Because I figure if you're meeting me, you're really considering it. Right. I'm going to give you a signing bonus to make to, on top of what you think you should get so that there's no reason for you to take the other meetings. $10 million is the number. He calls his wife. This is when I seen some early, some ball and shit. He calls his wife. When we land on the FBO, there's a $10 million personal check waiting at the thing, because we're going right to the office. I'm leading the pitch to LeBron and 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 Maverick and uh, this is his agent at the time. I can't remember this guy's name. Gordon, I'm sorry, Aaron Gordon. Doing the pitch, doing the whole thing, and we get to the thing, to the final stage, and Paul's going to present him the check. Paul presents him the check. I remember staring at his face. This is huge. We're going to sign LeBron James. We leave the room, we come back. When he leaves the check and says he's going to take the other meetings, I clap. I knew the world changed. A young black man, eight, 18 years old, walked away from $10 million going back to the projects. I clap. I clap, and it was my idea that didn't work. It meant so much. Not that the Reebok was wrong or the check was wrong, but the, the freedom and confidence and belief in yourself to do that. This is a new generation of individuals. This is a new generation of thought that's coming from African Americans. That's what I thought about. And I was so proud of us at that moment. Wow. And you pretty much been in his life because you did the beats by Dre commercial with him. You and did it with, with, man, drunk, man, with man, Ronnie. Like this, man, 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 man. LeBron and I like this, man. Me, LeBron, Maverick, Rich, they, I could tell you everything. I mean, Ramos, this is, these are my brothers. Right. These are my brothers. Maverick worked with me, you know, since he was six months before that. And Maverick was with me, you know, staying at my crib, working out of my office, you know, me mentoring him, giving him, you know, the tips, showing him the business, whatever. Like, those are my brothers. Right. It's like that. I've been in every iteration of that camp from the before the, the decision to this, the, every single thing. Love those guys. Love LeBron. And, and how you feel about him is, you know, I'll just tell you right now, forget the arguing of the who's the best basketball player of all time. There's not even a question. He's the best athlete of any sport of all time. But forget whether he's the best basketball player or not. He's the best professional athlete in any sport I've ever heard of, seen of. Nobody's even close. You did Alan Iverson's first commercial. It wasn't his first commercial. It was the only one he showed up to. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chuck, I love you, Chuck. The bad day is say practice. <laughs> Not a game, but practice. So the likelihood you getting him showing for a commercial was going to be tough. He showed up to the commercial, um, and it was a very special thing that will, you know, the commercial... With him and Jada Kiss, man, it played on radio like a song. The it, it became a song. It was Alan Iverson bouncing a ball, creating a beat that Jada Kiss rapped to. Right. Um, and when I did that, Hype Williams, 
who's a great uh, music director. Uh, at the time, he shot a lot of music videos. He dominated shooting music videos. Shot that. No one thought he could shoot commercials at the time. Why? <laughs> I, I have, still have no idea why that was even a thought. And we shot that commercial, and it was, you know, part of the, the package of talking about rebranding. We had mm-hmm. to Reebok was Skips. This is going to be very clear. You, you know what Skips are? And people, I don't wear those. Are, those are Skips. Yeah, yeah. yeah you don't want to wear those. You're right. Right. You skip those and find something else. You skip something and find something else. Those are Reeboks. We had to rebrand that. Part of it was um, this R, changing the letters to RBK. Okay. Um, Jay Z, obviously, and, and 50 Cent and all of that stuff. And then it was. AI and Jada Kiss. So we, we did work around AI and Jada Kiss. We did another spot with, um, uh, Stevie Francis and Scarface at the right. time. Yeah. Uh, ver- ver- that wasn't as successful, but we were doing this thing to fuse music and sport together. Cause my whole thing was like every rapper wanted to be a basketball player and basketball player wanted to be a rapper. Mm-hmm. And, um, that was, that's less true than it was back then, uh, today. But because of that, I wanted to create marketing and advertising around that fusion. And that was the way we rebranded Reebok. Right. How were you able to convince Jay-Z uh, to create a sneaker with, uh, with Reebok? It wasn't really hard to convince him. Nike at the time didn't believe in music as performed. Nike was very um, disciplined to its manifesto about athletes and performance. They wouldn't mess around with anybody else. So an artist, the most you can get from Nike was some free sneakers. Right. They wouldn't do business with you. There was no commercial opportunity. And Jay-Z knew, like the great ones do, that he was moving the culture. Okay? So when he told everybody we're wearing button-up shirts, we're going to change clothes, that was happening. If he did a pair of sneakers with Reebok, forget Reebok's uh whatever they were if he puts his name next to it they're gonna buy his sneakers right and he didn't have any self-doubt that forget nike i could do this with them and by the way while he was wearing his sneakers and selling his sneakers sometimes he'd wear nike too and he's like people ain't gonna believe me if all i did was wear my sneakers i gotta show them that i choose to wear my sneakers like I choose to wear those. Oh, it's an okay. option. But like this whole idea, like only wear your sneakers. He knew that would that that looks fake because that wouldn't be real. Right. What's real is I do like these. I also do like those. But it's creating an option, right? Which put that put Reebok in the conversation. Um. So it didn't really take much convincing. The convincing was, you know, getting a deal done. Not right. if Reebok was the right. And he company. wasn't an ambassador. He was a partner. No, Jay Z's not the ambassador of anything except himself. <laughs> he was a partner. He was a 50 50 partner. How do you, I, that's the thing? Because a lot of times these brands will throw a large sum of money and, a, and an athlete or an entertainer will take that. It's like, okay, fine. But how do you convince them, like, take less of this and become partnership or equity stake? Jay-Z understood that from the beginning because he was an independent artist. Okay. So when Jay-Z was selling music at the back of a trunk, the back of a trunk, which Master P did, which Birdman and Cash Money did, Luke Skywalker did, there's some great entrepreneurs who sold like literally hand-to-hand combat with distributing music. What they knew was whether they got there because they tried to get a record deal and then it, they got turned down so then they had to just do that, they learned the margin was there. They actually, that was the first time you got a chance to look under the hood and realize, wait a minute, this thing that cost me, you know, a dollar to make that I could sell for $16, all that money right there, that's mine. If I got a record deal, I'd be getting a small fraction of that. Once they learned, once you learn that, once you see that, you can't unsee that. Right. So betting on yourself, becomes the right thing to do because that's where the margin is. When I started United Masters, the whole point of building this company, our music company, was that I felt like artists should be independent. They should keep a lion's share of the money. They shouldn't give away their name and likeness because 
of a, of a, they got money when they was 18 years old or their first record deal. In order for that deal to be a good idea, the record company has to have a belief, more belief in you than you have in yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. Because they're basically saying, I'm giving you a half a million dollars and you're going to give me your name and likeness for the next 10 years or whatever the term is. You didn't even get a chance to find out what it's worth on your own. Right. Being independent, there was a period of time where it was hard to be independent. When those guys did it, not everybody was built for that. But today, while music is being distributed between Apple and Spotify, and you have a platform like United Masters that you can go through and put your music out and get it distributed everywhere, why would you not do that versus going to get a record deal, getting some money, but sacrificing, giving away all the upside for a short-term check? It just don't make no sense. But Steve, is it a, is it a case of... I've always wanted a record deal. I've always wanted to work with a co a record company. Yeah, it is that. By the way, Two Chains had the same argument with me years ago. He goes, "You don't understand." I'm like, "That's the dream." Well, the fact of the matter is, part of the dream is to get paid. That is not how you get paid. That's you're not going to get paid that way. Secondly, this is not. 20 years ago where you had to take CDs and get them into all these points of distribution right. and print up a bunch of CDs so your your cost outlay was so hard, was so expensive because you had to make the song and make 10,000, 20,000 of these things. You were out a lot of money before you found out if it worked. You can find out if it worked for $50 right, right now, you know, for, for, for nothing, essentially nothing. The cost of recording has gone down. You can... Sign up to a platform like I was for $60, put all the music out you want, and you'll find out if you ever hit. At least do that to find out if you want to make that decision. And then you have leverage when you make that decision later. Man, maybe I will get a record deal. But you already got a hit. So now they wow. can't sit and tell you, well, we're betting on you. No, 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 no. no. You know I got a hit. Right. I already bet on me. I already bet on me. So come correct. You see, you mentioned that Jay Z when he partnered with Reebok, and we see uh, Travis Scott now with Nike. I think M had something with Nike. Yeah. You see, uh, Jack Harlow's with New Balance. Uh, Fifty was G Unit had something with Reebok. Yeah. Now you see the culture as you spoke about, and you believe the influence that it had with brands. You see a lot more of that. Yeah. The, you really, I started. No, no, I started that. That's what I'm saying. You the no, 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 no. Started that. Everybody knows that. That's you. That's me. That's called corporate America. I'm going to introduce you to this thing called hip hop. Okay. And the music and the culture and everything that it represents can help you. That's what I did. Um, and everywhere I go around the world, anyone who knows me knows I did that. I feel great about that. Right. I own it not. I still do believe that we should be way more protective of who we give that to. Right. Uh, because you don't want to give it to people, again, that's not your partner who's going to invest in it to further it versus see what they could take from it. Right. Just for short-term gain. You don't want to give it away for that. Um, I don't think it's worth it. How do you determine whether or not to take a salary, a large salary, or take a smaller salary with equity in something. How do you, how do you determine that? How does Steve Stout determine that? So I'm in the music business. Yes. I went through something. Yeah. Okay. If you don't mind me telling you the story. I would love to hear it. I'm working at the record company. I'm at Interscope. I went from Sony. I went to Interscope. My salary is two and a half million dollars a year. I'm 27 years old. I'm doing well by anybody's standards. Yeah. Better than well. Yeah. Right. Um, making money, more money than football players back then in 97. Yeah. Okay. For sure. This opportunity comes along where I see, you know, Men in Black happens. The agency that put, uh, the glasses in product placement for, for, for Will Smith. Oops. Sorry. The agency that did that, I wanted to work with them because I'm, I've never met an agency before. I'm like, damn, you. Will Smith wore these glasses. The glasses went crazy. And everybody thinks that was an accident. I could do that shit every single day. I know exactly who the people are that should be touching these products in order to create, you know, an opportunity to sell more of that product. 
spent time with that agency, the guy made me an offer. I'll give you 25% of the agency and $150,000 salary if you come here. So I'm gonna leave the record business. Two and a half million dollars. All of the perks that come along that with come it. with it. Who you are, the rooms you walk in, everything that comes with that. To go work in an agency where I don't know anybody, I really don't even know the business, I just know that one aspect of the business. And I'm like, if I don't make that bet on myself now, and I'm 28 years old, 29 years old, when would I ever do it? When I have a family, when I have kids, I'll never make that bet. Right. I made that bet. We sold that agency within two years for $190 million. I was rich as fuck at the, by 31. <laughs> yeah. I was 31 years old. Wow. Doing it at an extremely high level. I'll tell everybody that. When I built this company, United Masses, the employees get equity in the company. I want people to get equity. I want people to, to make more money. But you can't teach people sacrifice. That's unfortunate. Yeah. You just can't teach it. That's what then you got to be willing to do. That's give what up you, you got to be willing to do that. I will offer that. But if you're going to sit there and, and think short term, then you're really betting against yourself. You got to be willing to bet on yourself. You can't think that you're getting away with something because somebody overpaid you. You got to believe that you are worth more than that salary and that you can prove that. And if you are worth more than that salary, why wouldn't you have equity? Whether, I mean, I just think that it's time, over time, the whole working class idea, how you work has shifted from the indentured servant, the slave, the employee, to ownership. You gotta have ownership. I mean, this is your show and I'm proud to do this with you because everybody publicly seen what you did, that you knew your worth. You created value and you knew your worth and you got what you deserved because you got what you earned. Correct. And if you don't have an opportunity to have ownership, then no matter how good you are, you'll never feel the impact of your value. Right. So, like, you got to do that. And you're going to take a short-term L to do that? So what? Right. Could you? I don't want to be one of these people. I never wanted to be one of these people who said, man, I came up with this idea. I invented this. I did all this shit but you never got a chance to benefit from it because right. you took the short-term money? That's not cool. And you see it all the time with your, a lot of your peers. I'm sure you, you want to tell them all the time, man. I don't know what you could do to help them, but a lot of these guys, are, they, they are trapped by that mentality of short-term. They feel like they're stealing or something. Like, they, right. like every time they get a check, they're getting away with something. No, you're giving away too much. Right. Well, it comes down to how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as talent or do you see yourself as a partner? Do you see yourself as an owner? For so long, we've been we've been talent. Taught to believe mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Because you come into football, they cut you a check. You're not part of it. You don't own part of the team. Mm -hmm. You come into basketball. But in this media space, what we've been able to do digitally. Okay. No. Hell no. But you know what? Even outside of the digital and... I ask you something, man. I watch your ex-partner, your, not your partner, your ex-host, mm -hmm. Skip. I, I don't even understand why all these other black athletes even go on the show now. I, I don't even understand what they're doing. It, to me, it's so clear that he needs black talent, athletes, rappers. He's doing everything to prop himself up. And I, I know he's getting paid over there. And everybody else is getting pennies on the dollar. I'm like, why would you do that? Why would you go over there and do that? He clearly isn't the guy. He needs you. Why don't everybody leave the show and watch, let's watch him do it for, for a minute. That show would be dead immediately. They get all these guys over there. They give him pennies on the dollar and he, and they prop him up. I'm like, we got to stop doing that, man. We can't do that no more. It, it's not, it's not worth it. And there's nothing that comes out of it long term, except what they benefit from. Well, I like where I am right now, so. Get in on the action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers who deposit $5 or more can get no sweat bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. 
Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code SHANNON. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 if your first bet loses. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code SHANNON. The crowd is yours. Never found my place in the crowd, so I stay from the crowd. They laughed at me then, but look at their faces right now. Jigga gave me the blueprint. I've been chasing it down, never run, chasing the clock. I'm just embracing my so run, never catch me worshiping. This is literally the greatest albums that came out in 1988. Like EPMD, Follow the Leader, and by any means necessary, Kid and Play, Run DMC, Saw and Pepper, easy. yeah, Easy Rock, Easy Ghetto E, Boys. Ghetto Ice Boys, team. yeah. This all came out, Ultra Magnetics, The Great Ball. Adventures, Slick Rick, Big Daddy Kane, this all came out. This is literally one year where a lot of these artists won independent labels. So they had creative freedom and made some of the best music that defined an era. Public Enemy, it takes a, it takes a nation of millions. Ooh, NWA was this. I even said to Dre, Dr. Dre, I'm like, you made Straight Outta Compton and you made the Easy Easy Does It album the same year, man. You made two crazy, beautiful classics. Mm, slick Ray. One year. Yeah. Salt and Pepper. And that's that's where I grew up in. I grew up in, uh, yeah. in Queens. This is like in my neighborhood, man. This is where wow. I, I grew up. So I, I just look at this. This is reminds me of being 15 years old, just watching this. Like they, they literally lived here while they were stars. Wow. So like you'd go to the mall and right. you would see them. Yeah. And LL Cool J like in the mall. Wow. At block parties. LL Cool J I seen that do block parties in Queens. Then what happened? Why well, can't stars now still do that? You can't even go back to the same neighborhood you go up in. Look, you should be a representation. They said, man, this guy lived here in this very neighborhood and he got out. We yeah. can. Well, look what happened to Nipsey, man. Yeah. He went back in his own neighborhood. You know, going back to your neighborhood, there's a bit of jealousy. People, I don't know, man. Back then, there was no choice. I mean, the artists were getting big and they were getting famous, but the art form hadn't gotten to the point where they right. got really rich. Right. 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 So people seen them, it was like, oh, shit, that's whatever. But when the money started to get in play, everything they changed. Yeah. yeah, everything changed. We're heading over to your borough. We're heading over to Queens, where it all started for you. Yeah. Is Queens the most overlooked hip hop borough? Well, we're leaving Brooklyn, right? Which gets a lot more hype because of Jay Z and Biggie. And Queens definitely gets overlooked. Yeah, you um, got LL, you got Run DMC. Keep going. You got Fifty. Yeah. You got Nicki. Yeah. You got Tribe Called Quest. Yeah. You got Nas. For sure. You got Mob Deep. They always forget about. I mean, Ja Rule. Yeah. Uh, Russell Simmons. Yeah. Irv Gotti. Uh, myself. You know, you it gets overlooked for some strange reason. I don't know why. Where I grew up at, within like a 10 mile radius, was right. where all these people were from. I used to go to the mall and see LL Cool J battling. Like in a, in a mall. Or, or go to a block party and see him, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because you know, those were the venues where guys would get off. The, right. the art form was so small. Right. It's like... The equivalent of guys playing with leather helmets. Right. This is the beginning. So right. everybody's doing all kinds of, they just trying to move it from point A to point B. And plus, Eddie came to America and landed in Queens. <laughs> That's so funny. I can't even believe he did that on Queens Boulevard. <laughs> Zamunda. He came right from Zamunda. So why do you think Queens doesn't get the credit or has the popularity, say like a Brooklyn, when it comes because, to hip hop? Because of the um, houses, backyards, grass. Yeah. You know, as soon, Queens is associated with middle class. Right. You know, with Brooklyn and the Bronx. It's more like, ah, uh, yeah. uh, uh. As so, that New York vibe, the yeah, real the New York vibe. Yeah. So the, Queens gets treated like, you know, and meanwhile, it's not true, but that's just the, that's probably been the energy associated with it. Um, but everybody knows Queens get the money, so I can tell you that. I mean, KRS and Boogie Down Productions, Molly Mall, The Bridge, The Bridge. I mean, could well, you- Hold on, tell me, well, Molly Mall mm -hmm. produced in Queensbridge. Yeah. Okay, Molly Mall is from Queensbridge. Yeah. Um, obviously, Karis One is from the Bronx. Right. Um, but that beef between Queens and the Bronx, Bronx, the Bronx won that beef. They won that beef. I mean, KRS One was- <laughs> I just, I just said it, man. I mean, I know, but I just said it. You don't have to, you don't have to bring it up. <laughs> they beat y'all down. 
<laughs> oh shit, that's funny. As far as you can go back, who were the first rappers to have beef? Well, the LL and Kumo cool D. Because that was the first. That's the first one I could I could think. LL kind of embraced the whole beef thing. I'm trying right. to think who. Before LL, who had beef that was blatant? There was like um, Kumo D was actually a, a battle rapper. There was a um, there was a mixtape early that was not. If you really know hip hop, that was like Kumo D and Busy B, mm -hmm. and that was like a very very famous tape. That if you heard that tape, you heard them battle. Right. And that was like for me, I must have been fourteen. That was like oh shit, that was the battle on MCs. So when LL Cool J and Kumo D battled, it was like oh shit, oh you ready for that smoke? This guy, Kumo D was a made man already right. from the underground scene. He he got famous with um, Wild Wild West and right. all that. Yes, yes. But he was already like a made man before that. Okay. We getting busy. Mm -hmm. When they battled, I couldn't believe LL came out on top. Because Kumo D was like that dude. And then LL took him down, and then LL, LL took down, LL made a song called To the Break of Dawn and took out, he took out Ice T and Kumo D. And Hammer. <laughs> he did all three of them yeah. when it was on. He gave each of them a verse. Yeah, that was... Like, he was really into that. He's always into that. Right. By the way, that's one of his issues. He, he, he only... That's the only mode he knows. Right. Like, when he rapped a lot, it was like, I'm going girls mode, or I'm going... This mode. I'm this mode. We rapping. <laughs> Are we going after it? We did a song with... Uh, he had, he, <laughs> this kid idolized him. Uh, I think cannabis. Yeah. And yeah, can and and Al just shit on the kid for no reason, man. He's Al is crazy. He's a can I bust. When, when he when he was when Al was rapping, like all the way, he still raps. But when Al was in that, a younger guy rapping like that, we put Foxy Brown on the record. He puts on on, on I Shot Your Remix, and then he puts on the record female rappers too. I don't give a fuck, boo. This girl is 17, man. <laughs> this girl is 17 on the record. Why are you saying you can take out female rappers too? I don't give a fuck. He's like a guy, man, who's like, it's either war or we talking about girls. Right. But this in between shit is not what I do. Why are you the best guy to interview music people right now? That shit is, you run with that, man. Yo, run. There is nobody. <laughs> there is nobody. Well, Nobody. I'm a sports guy, but I wanted to branch out. I wanted to show my versatility, Bro, but I was just more than a sports guy. The fucking baby interview, the Corday interview, yeah. even the Damon Dash interview, as fucked up as that was, he's a gigantic, almost, almost not. He blew it. He had Jay-Z. He had the most important artist of his so, generation. So, so what happened with that relationship? How did that relationship that was so good sour so fast? Dame's antics were just, it became, like people also, over time, you mature. Right. It's like, you, you didn't have friends at 16, but by the time you turned 19, they were still doing the same shit right. that you were 16, right. and right. you're like, right. I can't. Like, yeah, we gotta I, I gotta, I, yeah, we gotta, you know, I, you start spending less and less time with them because right. of it. It's like one of those things where Dame, Dame wouldn't change. The way he spoke to people, the way he treated people, his, he was angry. About what? Bro, you getting paper. He was angry because he had a strong perspective about his business philosophy. And if any time a partner of theirs tried to like go around him or, um, meanwhile, people weren't going around him. The people around him wanted to meet with other people. Right. They, they, people wanted were, were becoming less beholden to him, but he was unaware of it. And then he would like, you know, while he was building businesses, which partly he was, he would go off all around the world with cameras and girls and all kinds of crazy shit, and then come back flipping out on everybody as if, you know. They were wrong. Yeah. Or, or like, why'd you guys do all this shit without me? Like. 
Bro, you didn't build a business that was so operationally tight that you could just go away and come back and right. shit be the same and all that shit. It wasn't even like that. Jay grew up. You know, Jay wanted more. I think Jay seen Dame's ceiling. I mean, I think that's really what it was. I mean, I, I, Jay seen Dame's ceiling. You can't fault a man for wanting to get better. No, yeah, he wanted to. He wanted more, and um, everybody wanted more. I, I, Dame just had a very particular way of approaching it. He wasn't. He's far from stupid. Right. Very, very, very smart. Right. Uh, very talented. Ego through the roof, through the roof. So you, there was no working with him. Right. That, 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 no one wanted to work with him. There was no work. Yeah, well, that, as much talented as talent as he has, nobody wanted to work with him. People got to want to work with. Jimmy Iovine had this line: "When the shit gets bigger than the cat, you got to get rid of the cat." Right. <laughs> 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 How did the beef start between 50 and Ja Rule? That's a good question. Well, I know you know the answer. Yeah. Um, I think 50 knew that Ja was not who he was portraying as an image. Um, ja, you know, Jehovah Witness. Jehovah Witness is not for the rap? I'm not saying they're not supposed to rap, but <laughs> no, it was like John was coming out with his gangster image, and right. it was like, that's a stretch for you. Right. And I think 50, that was one thing. And then they had some like very neighborhood beef. And I remember when we signed 50, there was something going on. I think he snatched John's chain, or somebody snatched somebody's. It was one of these things. And they had a fight in Atlanta, uh, 50 fought him in Atlanta. And it was just like, I didn't even understand it. I'm like, why do you keep having problems with this guy? It was like I always. It was like he was looking for problems with him. To be honest with you, right. but it, I think it was driven by this idea that he, this image he was portraying that he didn't think was was authentic or whatever, and then he had a problem with him, and it led to, you know, big issues. And then Ja and his guys ran up on Fifty in a studio one day, right? And you know, they touched him up. Um. So they ain't gonna they never got, be cool. No, they're never gonna be cool. And now it's kind of, I'm happy that it's all kind of over with. Because it's, what I don't like at this point is older statesmen. Yeah. Like them. Still beefing. Still, because it makes the art form look bad. Right. You know, these guys are, are made men now. You know, like I, I love what Fat Joe's persona is today. And I love... Um, obviously what Jay represents and, and what Nas represents and, you know, the art form, the leaders of the art form, you know, doing well, you know, being positive, representing sort of as not role models, but representing the movement and the culture of hip hop. Well, right. For guys still to be beefing and still associating that and dragging that back in, and not on the older statesman level, the younger guys should be doing that. That's cool. But like the older guys, man, you you in your forties, bro. Right. I mean, why are you? T what are you talking about? I mean, you got kids at home, you got wives, you got. We already know this is not what it is. So why are you doing that? I don't like that. But look, it's also none of my business. Um, but I do always feel like, like hip hop, the business of hip hop culture is something that um, I carry with me. So I do have an opinion on it. Where, where some people would say, Steve, it's not your business. Keep right. doing your thing. Do you remember when uh, 50 crashed the stage with Hove, Diddy, and T.I.? Yeah. Um, 50's a wild boy, man. <laughs> he, he's a wild boy. Man, he man. don't mind beefing with anybody. He, he doesn't mind beefing with anybody. He likes that thing. He, 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 he loves it, in fact. I think he wants he, the attention from it. He understands what that brings. The best thing to do is to ignore him. Okay. If you ignore him, then it's over with. Because he really is doing it for the attention, the attention of it. Um, and by the way, that's fine. It's a great business tactic. Right. You know, because it does bring a lot of attention. I just think there's a, but like for him now, I mean, this guy's such a successful producer. I don't think he, he needs to do any right. of that. He's a businessman. Right. I don't think he needs to, he needs to do that. And he's talented, man. If uh, the, the people like like power in those shows, the the BMF yeah, shows, yeah. I'm gonna tell you something right now. If, this is where you hear it first. If that guy, with his real talent, is comedy. Oofy. Oh yeah. When he takes what he does in production and apply that to comedy, it's over with. He's that talented. 
Wow. That, that's his thing. Comedy. Hard times, I was broke, remember saying throw five on four. These days, when it only thing that I know. Fail so many times, now I niggas stand strong. So, so um, this, is my, this is my high school, man. There's a story here that I, I've never said on camera. I've told my daughter the story. I'm gonna tell it to you. Because it changed my life and I want people to understand it. Wow. When I first came, I didn't try for the football team till I was a junior. We're doing two days, and this shit is killing me. Like it's killing me, it, it, it. okay? Like I'm getting beat the fuck down, and this is a moment that changed my life. I come off that field, I got my t-shirt on, it's probably day four, I can't do this shit no more. I walk out. I walk right up this way, we walking right now. I'm gonna quit. I can't do this no more. I didn't think it meant anything to me. I want to play football. I, I, I can't do what they're asking me to do. This shit is too much. Now, that's what I thought. So I came out, I walked this way, and I stand up here at this bus stop. While I'm there, one of the coaches sees me. Coach comes by, looks at me, and says, Aren't you on the football team, man? What you doing? I looked at him like, nah, man, I... I'm not, no, I didn't say I quit. You I, said, I, I said, I'm not on the football team. I don't know what you're talking about. Meanwhile, my name is on the back of the jersey. <laughs> so he walks up. He knew I was he knew, he knew I was lying. What I did was... I left and I had to accept the fact that I, I quit. Right. I came back that year as a senior. I did everything I was supposed to do and made the team. And the last half of the season, I started at running back. The fact that I went back to finish that job that I started, and they never let, this football team, the Holy Cross, that's like the premier football in within an hour yeah. in, this, in this thing, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, and to come back as a senior and do that was the first time I did something I was successful. Well, I was like, man, I quit, but I couldn't live with that in my heart. And I had to come back and do that. And that shit changed my life, man. I told my daughter that story because everything that I did from getting into the advertising business, right. getting into the music business, there was no clear path. There was no path for none of it. Right. It was very easy to just say, yo, quit. But you didn't. I didn't quit. I didn't quit. So and the one time I did quit, I went back and fixed it so I could erase it, and it became the greatest lesson of my life. Had you not gone back, would you be the Steve Stout <laughs> that's standing not. right here today? I swear to God, no way. No way. If I got away with quitting... Because if you quit once, it's easy to do. Once you quit once, it's easy to do. Is that one of your greatest lessons? Yeah, that is the greatest lesson. I've never seen anyone fail who didn't quit. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Were you cool with Jay-Z yeah. and Nas when they had their beef? Yeah. So how did, you, how did you stay Switzerland to stay neutral? Part of it was easy because I know how much respect they had for one another. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where two people had respect for one another, they just never shared it with each other. Correct. And you're sitting in between them thinking, if they only knew what each other felt, they would. this would go away. Mm -hmm. That's what I felt. The part of it that was difficult was the outside pressure of people thinking, how could you be friends with both of them at the same time? You must be passing information or something like that. Mm -hmm. There was no information to pass. They had known each other before. They knew each other before me. <laughs> Actually, they knew each other before me. Right. And the issues that they had had nothing to do with me. It was, it was very unfortunate. To my earlier point about being an elder statesman, when they had a beef, no guns, mm -hmm. nobody got shot. Right. Lyrical. Mm -hmm. Songs. Right. And you know what? They made up as men right. in front of everybody. 
But that's what it's supposed to be. They had a conflict. It was handled through music. And they made up publicly. No one got hurt. No one got no guns. None of that. That's that really did a lot. As far as I'm concerned, for letting people understand that disputes can be handled. Right. And Mr. Yes. And that was dope. That was the dope part that came out of it. Jay and I are cousins. Oh? Yeah. I mean, I don't talk about it because there's no reason to talk about it. But I went to my grandfather's funeral and his grandparent is buried two lots down. Like they, it's like one of those type of things. Not knowing, is that how y'all guys developed a friendship even though you didn't know? No, we developed a relationship, a friendship, honestly, over Madden and, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, literally over Madden and um, there was some, there was a business deal that we were working on. Right. He was working on that he wanted that I decided I wanted to be a part of. Right. It was an artist that we were going to sign and it was a problem. And then when we went to settle a problem, I was like, man, I don't even give a fuck about this right. little thing. I care about really big things. And it was the way I talked about my dreams and ambitions for big things. Right. And he's like, I like this guy. Right. And then we became friends. We became friends. We became very close friends over time. How did you come to manage or be in the presence of Nas after Illmatic? I was representing these producers called the Trackmasters. Okay. And the Trackmasters were are very talented producers mm -hmm. who produced for um, Biggie. They produced, their big hit at the time was um, C Candy Rain. Yeah. Um, I love, uh, yeah. yeah. They produced that joint, uh, Mary J. Blige, what have you. But they the produced, condition. they produced under P. Diddy. Right. And he had this, this group called the Hitmen. So you never really got your own just out of it because you were part of a conglomerate. Your right. name was just like Puff Daddy and the Hitman. So they wanted to get out of the shadows of that and really be the thing. And I, you know, was all for that type of thing um, to help get them, set them up, their own business. They didn't have to do all that. So Nas makes Illmatic. Illmatic comes out. Illmatic is successful. And... The first thing the track masters want to do, they produce Biggie. They were making big rap records. They wanted to produce Nas. Everybody wanted to produce Nas. The problem was nobody could find Nas. <laughs> you know, Nas is a is a is an artist's artist. You couldn't find him through you know a series of events. I got to Nas, spent time with him. He trusted me as his manager, and we went to make on make the it was written album, and the it was written album was his biggest selling album of all time. And the first song that the track masters, when I put them together, they made was I Rule the World. Wow. Working with Nas is a, it's one of the greatest accomplishments I've ever had in my career. Really? Oh yeah. Nas is one of the greatest writers of all time in, in, in any topic, writer. And when you get a chance to work with that level of greatest, the, one of the best who ever did it, that, that this just doesn't happen. You know, it's just a very, it's a privilege to be able to say that you did that. And at the age of 26, 25, 26, when I was doing it, working with him, when we first started, all I knew was that I was working with this artist who was hot and had a, you know, make a big follow-up album. When you look back at it 18 years later, you realize you got a chance to work with one of the greatest who ever did it. How did you get him to adopt a more radio friendly, a more commercial friendly rap, considering that he had had success with Illmatic doing it his way. Who's helping you with these questions? I'm just asking, man, I'm just, Steve, I'm just asking you, man. I'm just, you know, we put a lot of time and research into this to make sure we get to know. It was a risk. He bet on me. He trusted me. He believed in me. I, I don't know how he knew to trust me. But I spoke to him a lot about the fact that we have to evolve. He understood that. Right. He understood that, what that meant. So that meant making bigger music, appealing to more than, because his first album, Illmatic, which is considered one of the greatest rap albums of all time. Right. 
hadn't sold that much. It wasn't popular, but those who knew it, the purists of the art form, understood it and respected it and held it in high regard. But this was also that plus make money. Right. And we had to make money, which meant we had to, you know, expand and, and grow, um, which is what, you know, me coming into the fold and helping him make it was written was about. But how do you get him to understand that because I read where in the beginning, he didn't really care about money and success. He wanted to write, he was a writer. He wanted he wanted to perfect his craft, but success and fame and money wasn't what it was about. What he knew was the thing was working. There was a very clear line between the artist that was making successful music and looking successful as a result of it, and the artists who were underground, local, right. couldn't couldn't get out the local moniker. And he didn't want that to be him. So whether it was about caring about money or not, he definitely cared more about expanding his audience. Right. Right. So it, he wasn't it wasn't driven by money. Like yo, we we. But the other thing that was important, uh, Shannon, was that during that time making money or being successful was a part of what was successful. Right. People wanted to see, you know, Versace and ah, and ah, and ah. <laughs> that was part of it. Right. So that was the lifestyle attached to it, to, to the music. He didn't care about money, but he did care about being successful. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my interpretation of that was let's make bigger music Let's make bigger songs and let's find the producers um, and the talent that can help us. And that was obviously working with the track masters, going to get, you know, Dr. Dre right. to produce uh, on that album, which nobody had done before. Making music videos and visuals, getting Lauryn Hill to do Sing I Rule the World. Right. Lauryn Hill, nobody could get Lauryn Hill. Lauryn Hill is Lauryn, Lauryn Hill. <laughs> you know, so the combination of all of that was what led to you know, us doing something that important. Now you see transition, he's Nas the businessman, the big private equity, you know, yeah. and all the stuff that we see him a part of. Was that you talking to him like, okay, to take to the next level to be what you want to be? No, I'm gonna be honest with you. I introduced Nas to a very dear friend of mine, uh, Ben Horowitz, okay. who invested in, in me and in United Masters and uh, I introduced Nas to him because Ben is a, is a tremendous fan of, 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 of rap music. And, you know, there was this whole idea that people who can move the culture should be involved in technology. Right. You know, because of that, Nas, you know, were a, was able to get going early in some very important venture investments. Mm -hmm. Coinbase being one of them, which was big, a uh, ring. Or the, yeah, the yeah, Amazon thing, yeah. right? And then, you know, that got him going and he built a a, a VC firm around that. And, he, you know, he has mass appeal and, you know, Nas is a great businessman. He's a, Nas is an all-around talent, man. He's a he's a very special person that that people love and adore. The, the, you know? seeming of the new thing now is people seem to be unloading their catalogs. Taylor Swift did something very unique. She released her entire catalog and now she got new masters, and the record companies are trying to say now that- They're trying to change agreements. Yeah. Yeah. There's two types of catalogs you can sell. Okay. One is your publishing catalog, which is the your share of writing. Right. Which are most artists can sell. Right. Their, version, their portion of writing a song. Right. Then there's another side of the catalog, which is the master side. Right. Most artists don't own that to sell. They don't own that to sell. Taylor didn't own that to sell. Right. Okay. That's the reason why she was mad. Because somebody they, they sold it to somebody else. And she wouldn't give her a chance to buy it. They, they, well, that's and, and and I'm gonna tell you something about that that nobody ever talked about. Her father owned a piece of that company. So I don't know why her father didn't tell her. Her father owned a piece of the company that sold it. Right. So I don't know how she didn't know any of that. Right. To be to be frank with you, and I got no horse in this race. It was just to me, it was just very odd that the beef was so loud that they sold it. Nobody ever told her about it. And I'm thinking, well, your father benefited from the sale of this. Right. Number one. Number two. 
most artists don't have that, which is the reason why I fight for that about ownership of masters, because that's the thing that has all of the long term value that you could, you know, your family could benefit from for, for years to come. Right. Which is the reason why you should maintain and own your master rights. The multiples that are being paid for these things are really high, very, very high. And for those who can benefit from it, it's great, which is the reason why, again, the artist should, should hold it. To me, it's one of those things that I personally, if I was an artist, I wouldn't sell it. If I owned my catalog, right. you can get a loan against it, right? Right. Bar against it, whatever. It's, it's very valuable. You can license it, right? But I wouldn't sell it. It's because what's happening is as technology changes, it keeps unlocking new value. So it was worth one thing then all, when, when there was, when there was a uh, vinyl. And then all of a sudden when CDs came, it became exponentially more valuable because then everybody started rebuying it again. Right. Right. All of a sudden you started buying Bob Marley's greatest hits or, you know, whoever, uh, 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 Barry White's greatest hits. Mm -hmm. so you name the act that you like. Every time new technology comes out, the catalog becomes much more valuable again because people are, you know, reformatting the music in which they have it on or rebuying that new format. Right. So it's very hard. The guy who's buying it is betting that the that the new format change is going to only lead to more value over time. The person selling it thinking it's not. If you can afford to get a loan against it or license it, you can still get some money without necessarily selling it again. That's what I would do. But the but the key is to own it. No. If you don't own it, you're not even in this conversation. You can sit here and ask artists, "What do you feel about selling catalog?" And they'll sit there and tell you, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't have any catalog to sell. Which is, the, which is again, fucked up. Is it true at your wedding, Kanye took the mic from Maxwell? Man, how do you know this, man? That happened for real? Man, shut up. Who told you that? The night has a thousand eyes on most nights. Nah, a man. No, no, no. Who told you this? I'm just at Steve. I'm just asking the question. I just want to know. I think my uh, my audience want to know. Maxwell was performing. Kanye <laughs> got up there and started freestyling. Yes or no? That happened. That. <laughs> that's so wild that you know that, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, Anthony. Who who would tell you that? Yes, Kanye grabbed the mic. And started freestyling, and it was um, <laughs> craziness. That's all I could say. It was crazy. So what oh, is about wedding, your wedding night? So what are you thinking? You got Maxwell. He's saying that this woman's work silently. Uh, uh, fortunate. Uh, fortunate, yeah. Ur Urban Hank Sweet. The whole album. Yes. You helped the NFL secure a $250 million deal with Apple. How, how is Steve Stout able to walk in any building, get a meeting, and can close a deal? Man, you could man, you could sell a hey, you could have a chicken to be secured at the hen house. How? I'm good, man. <laughs> I'm good it's better than do. that. It's more to it than that, Steve. Nah, I'm good at what I do, man. I see it. It's the it's the halftime show. It's it's the NFL halftime show. It's all about music. Why wouldn't Apple Music have that? Why wouldn't a music company be there? Pepsi's fine and Bridgestone before Pepsi, but like, why is it a tire company and or uh, Pepsi? Beverage company. Why wouldn't it be Apple Music? I mean, why isn't that obvious to everybody? I don't even understand what the only thing genius about that is that nobody else seen it, but it was obvious. So being able to speak to, you know, Eddie Q and the guys over at Apple, from Tim Cook to Eddie Q and mm -hmm. Oliver, those guys, they love the idea. And the NFL, of course, would prefer to be in business with a company like Apple. Who doesn't want to be in business with Apple? Yeah. Uh, Apple Music. And we did that deal and it was, you know, Rihanna year one and, um, you know, we know it's Usher this year. I'm sure you're going to be there. Be uh, there. You're damn right you'll be there. It's Vegas. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, it, it's fantastic. I'm, I love doing 
deals and doing business that makes significant impact. And I love the idea more than I care about my own personal, what I personally stand against. Seriously, it's like, Bono said something to me a long time ago, you can get anything done as long as you're willing to not take credit. The idea, as long as you remove who gets credit for it, then the, the politics around what makes a great idea come together become much easier to see. Right. Yeah. And that was one of those types of things. I had to get in deep enough to get it done, and then I got out of it once I knew we had a deal. Right. But I didn't run around talking about, oh, I did this deal. And, right. Yeah. For what? When you, you see where the prices are going for these commercials, seven, eight million dollars for 30 second spots. Yeah. <laughs> Where, 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 where are we, Steve, where are we headed? Are we headed 10, 15 million dollars for a 30, 40, 30 second spot? Yeah. You see where these teams are valued. Yeah. Right? Where these teams are valued? The fact of the matter is, man, the top 100 shows on television, 90 of them are NFL, NFL games. Yeah. And the more it becomes rare to get that level of audience around something, the more they can charge. Because there's nothing else that garners that level of attention yeah. at one period of time. Yeah. If you break it down, it's probably the best money spent. Yeah. You got a hundred million, you got a hundred million people watching for three hours. How about this? And oddly enough, wanting to see the commercials. Yes. That one event is the only event where people go, I can't wait to see the commercials. Right. There is nothing else. Every every other thing you're trying to skip the commercial, get yeah, around the commercial. Yeah, this right. is the perfect time to use the bathroom, <laughs> not the end, not the Super Bowl. Right. That's when people want to watch commercials. So I mean, seven, eight million dollars, whatever. And, and 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 I think that I think the NBA Finals and NBA playoffs, people want to watch these things, man. I would I would charge more. It's the only game in town. It's the only thing live sports dominate television yes they can charge whatever they want and it's worth it i mean it's worth it because the the attention that you get is very hard to cobble putting together a bunch of other different media it's just very difficult to get have you ever uh, uh, uh created a super bowl commercial is that something you liked it hell yeah man <laughs> i did a super bowl commercial so long ago and the ship blew up, and I didn't even realize how big it was. Terry Tate, office linebacker. Yes. Yeah. That's you? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> do you remember that? I do remember Terry He just started tackling people in the yes. office. Yes, yes. I did that for Reebok, man. I did that for Reebok. This guy was running around with a film of this guy tackling people in the office. Uh, he's a famous director now, Ross and Thurber. And he had this young guy showing this film. I seen it. And... Um, we representing Reebok. We pitched it to Reebok. And literally, it was a Reebok.com commercial. Go to Reebok.com. And that thing went crazy. Terry Tate, office linebacker. Yeah, I remember that. We're the agency, the, the creative solutions company, uh, as I like to call us, because that's what we do. We solve bigger problems for uh, the NBA has been a client of ours for many years. State Farm, all those State Farm mm -hmm. commercials that, yeah. you know, Aaron Rodgers and Chris Paul, and Cliff, Cliff Paul, and yeah. all that. we've done all that work for years. Uh, and now uh, AT&T uh, is one of our clients. It's been our clients for four or five years. But I want to talk to you about because yeah, we, we don't get we, to we did, talk we, about this we helmet did this, and yeah. the special. What makes this helmet special? Yeah. What we did here, man, uh, which I'm very proud of, is a lot of times people talk about advertising and it's like selling stuff. Right. But I like to really think about how do you use the power of advertising to tell a story or, or solve problems. And we found out about the story about Gallaudet, which is a school for deaf, or hearing hard of hearing, impaired. hearing impaired. There was a time where hearing impaired players actually made it to the pros. There were few of them made it to the pros. Mm -hmm. But as technology... I played with one my, uh, my second year, Kenny Walker, went to the University of Nebraska. He was hearing impaired. So then, perfect. So now what happens is, as you start putting in technology and the helmets now you can call audibles and the, if you're playing quarterback or linebacker you, you 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 can't even compete if you're hearing impaired you can't so we've seen this problem we took it to AT&T and the great team over there um they actually wanted to see how could we help solve this problem using uh 5G technology okay so what we did was uh we worked on this for three years Shannon this helmet um has a special chip here and this chip allows 
players who are hard of hearing to actually see the play versus just hearing. It. Right. Right. So the coach takes this and and literally I can put the play in here, flex, uh, you know, whatever, play action, Pittsburgh. Right. So that's the play the coach calls. Right. And I can just put in the audible right here and the audible comes up on this visually. Wow. So the, so the player gets to see this. This is a game changer. We put this on these players. It changed their lives, man. This play is saying, I, I got the speed. I got the vision. I got the eyesight. I got everything as a professional athlete. I just can't hear. Right. I'm hearing impaired. Um, so uh, they, they're using this. They're now. using this right now, man. They're using this right now. It's one of the most things I'm most proud of that we did that and we're changing people's lives. So, you know, I, when I say that we are a uh, creative solutions company, mm -hmm. that's not advertising, man. Right. That's coming up with new ideas that's going to help change people's lives. Right. It's much bigger than advertising. Right. Right. So you're the consultant for the Knicks. You did some work for the, uh, to make the Nets cool. Well, I moved the Nets from, from Newark to Brooklyn. Right. Right. So we did that very early. I'm also the, we also represent the Big 12. Yes. Yeah. To make them cool. Yeah. Well, the Big 12, what's going on in college sports is so crazy now because the game, the rules have changed, bro. Yeah. I mean, the NIL. The, the, between NIL deals, between the relocation of the Big The relocations of, the, of every team. You, it used to be regional. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Like you, if you played for the Big East, then you were in the Big, Big East. East. Yeah. Man, you could go from there and be there. The, the, the region, regions don't mm -hmm. even matter. A lot of it, I, I, I still think I have a problem with because of what it does to the student athlete. Okay. The fact that you got to travel across the country. How could you even study? Right. How could you actually get right. your schooling together if you're playing in different time zones? Yeah, like USC, USC and UCLA coming to the, <laughs> the, the Big Ten. Yeah. How? Cali, how that yeah, that's, that's a lot, yeah. right? Um, but anyhow, between NIL deals and the fact that these teams are changing conferences so fast, recruiting, materials around recruiting, how you market your teams, how you market your team and your program, uh, changes dramatically. Look, man, we, at the Big 12, we, we just got Colorado, right? You want to have Colorado. Right. Like, and I'm sure everybody was pitching Colorado, mm -hmm. the AD at Colorado to get them. You know, we put together the materials to help make them uh, make them very successful. And, I'm, you know, I work with Brett Yormark, who's the commissioner of the Big 12. I worked with him when he was at the Brooklyn Nets, when we moved them from Brooklyn, right. from Newark, New Jersey to Brooklyn. And I work with him now uh, for the Big 12 and love working with Jim Dolan. Uh, very, very misunderstood man, yeah. talented as hell, loyal as hell. How do you go about rebranding? Because th th to rebrand something, people have an idea or perception of what it is. How do you change that perception? There's a lot of different things that go into it. Um, how it sounds, you know, the, the, the sonics of a brand. Like, you know, when we did I'm Loving It for McDonald's, you remember those, but you also remember da 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 da, mm -hmm. right? So sonically, those are branding elements that you have to deal with. The texture and tone. Um, the, when you, sometimes you ever watch a TV commercial, and because it has a white background already, you kind of know what it is before it comes on. Or mm -hmm. There's certain colors that you can tell. Colors play a very important role in, in branding. So sometimes when you're rebranding, you you play with colors. You, right. You play with sounds. It's not just casting. Right. Like, oh, let's just use this famous person or let's, you know, put two white guys and one black guy and make it different. And like things like that. It's really understanding the totality of what leaves an impression with somebody breaking that down and figuring out what aspects of that story that you're going to pull together in order to retell that story. Right. Um, it, it's a craft. It's very, it's, it's craftsmanship. And, you know, most people, unfortunately think that just at, throw a famous person against this and close your eyes and they'll fix it. Some hope. Yeah. You know, a lot of times putting famous people against brands, two things happen. You don't believe it. Right. right. So the, does the celebrity and the brand have shared values? Right. Shared values. What do we have in common so that when people see us together, they go, oh, that makes perfect sense because they that's how they rock. Right. So that's successful partnerships around shared values. Or you put them together and they're just expensive ideas that nobody ever believes. Like you put, I used to always use like, you know, back in the days, like who believed that Tiger Woods drove a Buick? <laughs> you know, like, how are we gonna get? How are we gonna get this off? 
Right. Like, how are we going to figure this one out? You know? And th- th- so there's a, there's a lot of bad ideas like that right now to this very, when you look at it and you're like, are you serious? The other thing I tell a lot of, you know, uh, guys in the music business specifically, cause all this brand money is coming at them is you got to be careful who you choose as a partner because when they sign the deal, it's one thing. You get a check, you feel good. But when they fire you for lyrics or fire you for behavior that you was actually doing when they hired you. Correct. But it's really loud now because getting fired is a loud thing. You famous, you got fired, you got let go. Be careful about those people, man. Not, Not every check is a good check. Right. And make sure you are going into a partnership with somebody. Because these brands, I will tell you, man, they will sign you. And as soon as they feel any temperature, they cut bait. And they will cut bait and it will be loud. And you will look as if you did something that they were completely unaware of, which is the exact same thing that made you famous. (laughs) It's why they got in business with you. Choosing a brand partner is almost as important as choosing a life partner. Oh, yeah. Because the brand partner can affect your reputation. 1,000%. 1,000%. When they let you go or they say something about you because they parted ways with you, and however, you know, eloquently they decide to, to say that you guys parted ways, there's a stench on your name as if you're not, because what do you think the other brands do? Don't mess with that person. Right. Right? As a result of that. So again, that becomes contagious. So you have to be very careful who you partner with because... Some of them, they're not in it for the partnership. Right. They're just in it for the quick burn of fame. How many followers you got? How many likes you got? This, that, and the Impression third. They're, you can they're not really invested in you. They don't give a shit about you. They care about that. And as soon as that gets a little bit tainted, a little bit uneasy, because you said a word that they didn't know or somebody didn't, those are in your lyrics already, man. Right. You know? Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I always give that advice and anybody watching this that's a musician or look at or influencer, make sure you pick your partners correctly. Make, make sure they're really your partners. How do you strike the, how do you strike a balance? Because you said you left the music injury in industry to get into advertising. So how do you strike the balance between athlete and brand? Because you have a vested interest on both sides. Because a lot of these athletes you have a relationship with. Yeah. And obviously a lot of these brands you have a relationship with. And you want to continue yeah. to foster that on both sides. Because there's because there there is there actually is a true sweet spot between athletes and brands. There is a great relationship. If you don't you you look at TV, you see some of these commercials and just like what about this story that they're telling is actually gonna help make this athlete look aspirational, important, like they're doing something that really matters. Sometimes they actually use the athlete and make them look like dumb jocks. Mm -hmm. Sad enough to say, they make them look like that. Versus somebody who you should look at as a rare, unique, special, talented individual Mm -hmm. who's more than an athlete, (laughs) okay? To quote LeBron Mm -hmm. and what they do at Spring Hill. but if you but if you work with people who are not willing to get deeper past the surface to help tell those stories, then you're going to end up with commercials where the athlete says two words and try not to let them talk too much and just put everything around them and just cut around them. But that, that's not that's not business. They're not making that much money off of that anyway. Why are you even doing it? Right. You got ten million dollar, fifteen million dollar, twenty million dollar guaranteed contracts. They're not paying you that much money to do the commercial. So only do it if it's doing something to help manage up your image. And you ask, you ask Chris Paul, you ask LeBron, you ask Jason Tatum, you ask anybody who works with me. There's nothing that I do unless I can look at it and go, did we do something to elevate your image? Did we do something to tell a story that you always wanted to tell, but this is the greatest outlet to tell that story? If we're not doing that, we're not doing no business. That's not, that's, I don't work that way. I'm looking at some of the athletes that you work with and entertainers. Giannis, Lil Baby, John Morant, Clay, Meg. Giannis, man, Giannis, we told a story. We showed a film going back. No, when he talked really intimately about the fact that he'd go to Greece, Greek, because he's Greek, he'd go to Greece, go home, and they'd look at him like he was a black guy. So there was a certain level of race tension around that, racist mm-hmm. tension. And then he'd be in Africa and they looked at him like he was white guy from Greece mm-hmm. and how he had to live within the balance of that. 
and the power he found in growing up in those two worlds. We told a beautiful story about that with uh, uh, uh with with with, with uh, his partners at um WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. uh, WhatsApp is the global communications company, right. and very few uh, artists uh, athletes are as global as Giannis. Correct. And we told that story through that lens, man. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I love doing. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets to your next big event. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all your sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and the best price guaranteed, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Game Time is the only ticket app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All-in prices show you the total up front so you know exactly what you're getting a great deal before you check out. Buy tickets in two seconds with two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code SHAYSHAY for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an app, redeem the code SHAYSHAY for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I watched you for the last Two and a half years. It was just why when you're on on the FS1 show. How long you been on that show? Four years. I was there, I was on that show for seven years. Yeah. Uh, we uh, came in together. Uh, Skip started. They we started the show in 2016. It was a great run. It was. I watch you on the show, and I watch you get better over time. And yeah. when you started getting comfortable and bringing in your all of your natural self to it yeah. to the table, it was a game changer. Yeah. It was a game changer. Well, that's the thing. When you were sneaking in those lines with the the, the, the brown, bracket, yeah. the bracket miles and all that, yeah. and then social media started to pick it up. Yeah. And you know the right delicate balance, which is very hard. The producer Craig Barry is a friend of mine who produces um, Inside the NBA, Inside right. that, yeah. that, yep. that yep. show. Yep. And it's that's the magic. How do you get that talk off while still being an expert at the core thing, which is sports? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Did you think? That fifty years, the, what it started fifty years ago, hip hop, and you said it was in its infancy when when LL was doing with you know you could go to the mall and you could see LL and you could see Run DMC hanging out in the mall and you could see the battles. Did you think it would be what it is today? I mean, you're a great forward no, thinker. No, 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 not. I knew what I. I never thought the music would be this big. Mm -hmm. I knew that the other things around it would be big. Right. Um, the clothing. Right. Um, the style. I never thought the music, I never thought at any point in time it was going to be the number one music in the world. I, I, I didn't think that. I remember I used to go to, to France. If you do your thing out there, you have no idea what happened. So I went to Cannes and um, I seen graffiti and I was like, when I see graffiti, every time I see graffiti, it makes me think the culture has touched this place. Yeah. I get comfortable around graffiti. Right. Because I know there's people who are trying to say something mm -hmm. and they're looking for a canvas, canvas to say it. Right. I love that. I love that. I've always loved that. You say LL from Queens. I mean, yeah. we go. LL was the first. I mean, the the guy that. That's who you like when you came. Yeah, up? man. L was there. You know, look. I love when L and Kumo D battled. I grew up on. How old are you? Fifty five. I'm fifty three. All right. So, we used to go. But when you they lived in the rurals. Yeah. And how are you getting the music? I grew up about 65 miles from Savannah, and they would come to the Civic Center. Uh, cool Mo D, uh, the Fat Boys, Run DMC, Houdini. And you went? Of course. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because LL -L and I are about the same age. Yeah. And so, anytime that they were coming to Savannah, we were there. And they had a show, they had Houdini, they had uh, LL, they had uh, Run DMC. I mean, it was like seven groups. And it was unbelievable. And everybody knew all the words. Every last one of them. LL Cool J was a, was a, was a, I mean, is a star. I mean, he. he I don't think you get the credit he deserved, though. How? He's a. Yeah, I, no, I'm talking about the commercial, but I'm saying when you talk about great rappers, don't nobody mention L. You know what, L, yeah, he was funny, man. What would he be in sports? I have an argument all the time. 
This is funny to me. <laughs> Everybody, like, there's a certain style right. that people appreciate more. So they don't give a different version of that right. approach the same amount of credit. So right. L, was he as great as a lyricist as Rakim or Kane? No. No. Was he a better total package? Absolutely. Yes. That's why he still has a career to this day. He made bad albums. He made bad albums. He made he made really good albums, then he'd made bad. He used to go through this pattern where he would experiment and make bad albums. He'd probably tell you that the, what was considered a quote-unquote bad album was learnings for the album that came after that that was great. But he was willing to take chances and make big records as a result of it. So he doesn't get the credit for that. But a lot of the guys that do get a lot of credit, you realize had really short careers. Yeah. Really short careers. Yeah. Um, in sports, I use this analogy like, you know, everybody thinks, you know, Mike Tyson is, I mean, obviously Mike Tyson is a larger than life figure. Mike Tyson was probably great for four years. Yes. 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 Four. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Four yes. where you couldn't even touch him. Nope. And then after that, he became whatever affected his life. Right. It all changed. Correct. You know, a lot of these guys who get more credit than LL Cool J as rappers really I mean, have short careers. Because if you think about it, Big and Tupac, short careers. What what was Tupac? Five years? Biggie five years? Yeah. If that? Yeah. Th that's listen, man. You ain't gotta tell me. That's why hey, there should be statues of Nas and Jay Z. Yeah, for sure. Stat these guys who endured right. the entire mm -hmm. they were there yeah. before and after. Yes. You know? Yes. To go to to go through the gauntlet of what it was, whether it was East Coast, West Coast beef or drugs or drug dealers or just whatever the issues were that comes with being a young man in your 20s and millions of dollars in right. attention, media attention, global attention, you know, people want to kill you, whatever it may be. Right. To avoid all of that, to get to the other side, yeah. is they should have a monument. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. since you, you're, you're close to my age and you, you like I say, Big Daddy Kane, KRS-One, you know, Molly Ma, I mean, you you know you know them all, uh, M, Hove, Wheezy, Nas, give yeah. me your four goats. My, if we had a Mount Rushmore, give yeah, me a yeah, Mount yeah, Rushmore. You do this all the time. I sure do. Well. I sure do. Um, Let me see if I have to throw your list out the window. I'm going to roll this window down. Dog, it's a, this is a, I'm about to throw your list out the window. Well, let me, before, let me just ask you this question before we get to the list. Okay. Are we factoring in tenure? Because if I just took everybody's best album and to base it off of that, That'd be different than if I yeah, but I don't, think, I don't, I don't, I don't think you can say. Like if I say who's the best running backs of all time, right? Well, you can't say well, that whoever had the best year because there are a lot of there are a lot of running backs that had better years than uh, had a better year than Emmitt had a better year than than Jim Brown had a better year than Walter yeah. Payton. But yeah. that doesn't make. But it, it goes into the longevity. Yeah. yeah, but if I ask people who the best running back of all time is, they don't immediately go to Emmitt who has more. No, 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 no. They're probably none of them. Probably going to say Emmitt. They'll probably say Barry Sanders. Yeah. They'll say Walter Payton. Yeah. They'll say Jim Why? Brown. Why? You know, I, I think it's it's all Barry. Even though Barry never won a championship and would lose a lot of yards and a yep, lot of carries, but it was the style. He was so people electric. Like, people like that style. They, he was so electric. Uh, Jim was 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 uh, a man amongst men. I mean, he led the league in rushing like eight times in nine years. He's won the uh, uh, MVP as a rookie. Walter Payton was sweetness. Bad offensive line, but he still gave people that work. Mm -hmm. So. People, people like that. For uh, like I said, uh, as far as lyricists, KRS was one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. But and for the longest time, I was on this thing like it was Tupac for me. But after la like the last two weeks of just listening to Wayne, and I love him. Yeah. We hey, 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 no, Wayne, 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 Wayne is Wayne is ridiculously talented. I. For me, it would be um, just ability, superb ability, marksmanship. It's Nas, Jay, Biggie, Rakim. Yeah, Rakim was like, yeah. And then that other spot, I. You don't got them all. You ain't got the four spots. Oh, four. Those, I would take those four. And I love Eminem is nice. Eminem has a unique gift about him. The way his cadence, yeah. how he raps and puts words together around that cadence is special. Wayne is 
as good as anybody. Wayne, Wayne and his career is amazing. Yeah, I mean, you talk about special. longevity. I mean, oh, the dude was like no, 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 a 12, Wayne, 13 no, no, no. year old. Nah, Wayne is Wayne is Wayne is a special dude, man. Wayne is a special dude. For me, he just reasonable doubt and Illmatic. Um, I mean, Jay has more albums. Nas has a couple more albums, but with that body of work is just so strong, yeah. and it, it and it hits me right here. Right where, where Wayne does that to like, if I ask Rich Paul this question, Rich Paul would immediately have Wayne like Jay Z Wayne. Right, he'd have Wayne right there. Right, you know, because he's just younger. Yeah, and he spoke to him. Right. What about Kane? People don't get Kane the credit he deserves. Yeah, Kane. Kane had his Kane, Kane was tight. Kane was tight. His career was short. That'd be the problem with short. But career, you know, back, man. But, but if you go back and look at it, if you think about it, guys didn't have 10, 15 year career. Now you gotta like, have L, you gotta have more than two albums. Yeah, though, but L, L is an anomaly. To be able to do what he did in the eighties and here he is doing doing what he's doing right now. No, but you gotta the, the be able you gotta you gotta stick to your craft, man. You gotta do you like you gotta make two, three, four, five, six albums. You gotta make. You gotta keep making music. So, so you want. So you gotta. You know how hard, got, you know hard it is for these guys, uh, Shannon. You grow up in the projects. Mm -hmm. Fine. You go to the projects, and um, you're writing your first album right. based off of everything you went through your entire life. Correct. Right. So you have. 18 years, 20 years of material, however right. long, to make this first album. Right. When you make your second and third albums, now you're using the material that happened between when you put out the first album and that second, second album. album. But now there's money, there's women, there's access. So now all of a sudden, your material starts to fade mm -hmm. because you start you're indulging in yeah. all this other stuff. There's a difference. You don't there's live that difference. same now you live in, Now you move to L.A. Now you're writing about something else. So a lot of times it's very hard to write that second, third. Second, you can still get away with off the fumes of the first album. Mm -hmm. The third album becomes really hard. Right. Th oh, you get it. Look, most artists who write the, who had a great first and second album m fail miserably on the third album. It's so hard to draw from the, the grit that you had before you made the first album that, and then and then now, okay, fine. Can you get back to it now? Right. A lot of times they can't get back to it, and it just slowly, it slowly falls off. LL went back to it. LL made Mama said knock you out. Right. He made all that shit, made this, went like this, and then boom, Mama said knock you out. Right. He came back. Kane didn't make Mama said knock you out. Honestly, Rakim didn't make Mama said knock right. you out. They couldn't make it. They couldn't find that record seven years later. He said, he made Mama Said Knock You Out and Round Away Girl. Yeah. Oh, and that one he had. Uh, and then he made, after years after that. Your Jingling Baby. Uh, the, the Jingling Baby remix. <laughs> and then he made Love You Better after that. He yeah. has a phenomenal, phenomenal Hey Lover. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. I, I worked on that album. That was 95. Yes. Hey, lover, and uh, doing it well. Doing that was ninety five. Wow, man, by the way, that's ninety five. He was dropping records in eighty seven. Yeah, correct. But ninety five came around. I don't even know where Kane and Rakim was. I'm bad. But, nah, I'm bad was a little. No, nah, don't do that. Don't do that, Steve. Don't do that. Don't do that. I ain't gonna let you do that now. Come on now. <laughs> Listen, I'm an LL Cool J fan too. <laughs> The dance routine and I'm bad when he did the shark fin. Yeah. I knew that's what you was doing. Yeah. That wasn't the real thing right there. That was a little too much. And I'm going mm. back to Cali. By the way, huge record. That's a risk that artists wouldn't take. Listen to that beat. That's a risk that artists wouldn't take. That was on the Less Than Zero soundtrack. That that was that was look at the video. Artsy, black and white, very, very avant-garde. Like that was way ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. Those are the risks that those guys wouldn't make, uh, that he was willing to make. He's a true artist, and he does deserve he does deserve way more credit than he deserves uh, as an That's artist. That's all I wanted you to say. Now yeah. we can move on to conversation. Yeah. See, but he was one of the first also to have commercial ap appeal outside of the rap game. Doing Fubu, we had the Gap stuff. Yeah, the Gap stuff. 
I don't know if you, he did something in the Gap commercials, one of the most gangster shits I've ever seen before. He's in the Gap commercial, and he has a FUBU Ooh. hat on. Yep. Do you remember the rap? <laughs> I don't remember, but I, I remember. Let me tell you the rap. Forget, it wasn't that he had the hat on, like, damn, this nigga's in a Gap commercial with a FUBU hat on. Gap people didn't even know what that was. Right. Whatever that thing was. Right. In the commercial, he raps and says, for us, by us, on the low. That's in the rap. Right. They don't even know that's what he said. He said, for us, right. by us, on the low. Everyone in a commercial for the gap. For the gap. <laughs> no, they don't even know what on the low means. Right. They don't even know what for us, by us means. Right. They think he's just saying, for us, by us. Right. I don't know, some rapper shit. Right. Because I had Damon John on, and he was he was telling he was telling me that story about uh, L shooting a commercial and doing the rap and had it on. One of the guys from Queens who started who started Fubu with Damon is a guy named Keith. He, he he we went to kindergarten through third grade together. Right. So there was also some great entrepreneurs, obviously from Queens as well, who helped start um, uh, start start Fubu. I mean, y'all. I mean, look, Queens. I mean, like I said, you guys, y'all get overshadowed because obviously, you know, Brooklyn has some of the, the, the names. But if you look at what you guys were able to do, as far as not only just music, but culture, and and, and and the clothing and merchandise, would you consider that Run DMC brought fashion into hip hop? Because they had the little that's leather Adidas. Leather, that's why I'm wearing leather pants. Leather pants. Yeah. The uh, 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 the shell tour Adidas with the fat screw shoe string. Yeah, they were, the they, big ropes. Yeah, prior to Run DMC, guys were looking like, if you look at um, some of the early, if even even kind of like Sugar Hill Gang, but after Sugar Hill Gang, yeah. if you look at Africa Bambada, yeah. they, got, they were dressing more like Earth, Wind & Fire. Yes. Like a lot of costume. Mm, yes, yes. And then Run DMC, because of, God bless, Jam Master J said, let's dress like those D-boys. Right. So they dressed like the way street guys dressed, right. drug dealers were dressed. Mm -hmm. And that's and when they put that look on, yo, with boom, the Kango. Boom, boom, Kango, Shell Toe, Leather, Blazer, this, that, yeah. and the third, then they looked like they was just getting that money. Right. It wasn't about that costume. It was a complete uh left turn from what those guys were doing, and that was that was huge. How big was Supreme? The name says it all, man. <laughs> I mean, Supreme Team was Queens. They ran the streets of Queens, and there was a they were a presence to not to be fucked with. Right. And um, you know, to me, I, I never, I actually never met Supreme. I seen him before, but he was, you know, a, a big larger than life figure mm -hmm. that that had a you know a big organization that were street guys that liked to party, you know, and they were like part of the business. Right. You know, uh, so yeah, they were big. I mean, they were big. Supreme Team was big. Um, then years later, you know, BMF was big. Right. You know, coming out of Atlanta. What is it about D Boys and rap and rap and D Boys that seem to be so interwoven? Well, the kids come from the artists are coming from the street. So as a result of the artists coming from the street, the guys that are around them and the guys they idolize. They probably at some point worked for right. were the street guys. And sometimes the street guys were the first guys to give them money. There was the startup money. Right. You know, go make this music, go right. into the studio, what have you. And that's a lot what led to, you know, what got them going. So that's that's the con that's the connection. But the truth of the matter is, even prior to the fact that that was the guys they looked up to uh, and gave them money, that's what the fans wanted. Right. So you were emulating the street guy. So a lot of these guys... Very few of them really are street guys, rappers. Mm -hmm. They were more emulating street guys because that worked with the fans. How have you been able to create the music, the advertising with some of the most successful companies in the world? You started in the music business. Yeah. You transitioned to the advertising and you work with a lot of these Fortune 500 companies. How have you been able to transition and parlay that, your music, your advertising, and with some of these Fortune 500 companies? How have you been able to do that so successfully? Early on, it was hard. It was hard for two reasons. I wasn't necessarily good at it. Uh, I, I didn't. 
I didn't go to college and I dropped out of college. So I didn't have any formal training and the credibility that comes with that formalized training to go into Fortune 500 companies and be like, this is what you should do. And then the second thing is the thing I was trying to recommend them doing was really tapping into culture. And the culture that I was leaning on was hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. And that was tainted with gangsters and all kinds of reputational issues. So you got me coming in with no formal training and talking about something that is related to something that they don't even think is brand friendly. Um, and then I would say, you know, to the CEO, cause I'm really good at with talking to people. Mm -hmm. So I'd speak to the CEO and I'm like, ask your 17 year old at home about this. Cause if they had a teenager at home, I'm going to win. And I would speak to them about things that I knew was not necessarily on their radar screen, but it was the next generation's concern, next generation's something they celebrated. And I call that future proofing. If you want to future proof your business so that the next generation is excited and you're relevant to them, then you should listen to what I'm saying because I'm talking about something that may not necessarily relate to you, but it relates to the next person coming down the line. Wow. And CEOs who are open-minded to listening to that were the ones I've had the most success with. And their business has benefited. And the first thing I, the first thing I did, I mean, it's written about but it was the Reebok work, man. I mean, you got Reebok. I, I told the, 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 the CEO, Paul Feynman, founder of Reebok. I said, I don't care. This is a 2000, 2002, maybe. I said to Paul, I said, Paul, there's nothing you can do to make kids believe they can jump higher or run faster in a pair of Reeboks over a pair of Nikes. There's no chance that take that idea that you're going to beat them at that game completely out of your mind. So then he started talking further. He, he was intrigued by that, by the certainty I had with that belief. And he started talking about brown shoes. I'm like, why do you say brown shoes? He goes, because people wear brown shoes to work. I said, Paul, no, they don't. Kids are wearing sneakers to work. Right. In fact, they're not even wearing the sneakers because they want them to perform well. They, they wear them because they like the color in it because it matches their right. shirt. It matches their hat. So we need to actually go and play and pay that, play that game and pay attention to that consumer. And that's what led to Reebok, RBK. And then we started thinking about like, who are some of the people that you could work with that would fit and sort of be the cohort? The cohort is the, the prototype mm -hmm. for this thing. And it was Jay Z. I'm like, this guy, he don't like to move a lot at all. He don't like to sweat, <laughs> you know? Right. And he's the perfect person to be the lifestyle ambassador. And we created not an ambassadorship, but we actually created a brand called the S Carter, which was the first of its kind, an original sneaker um, that was Reebok powered and made it. And that was successful. And then we did the G units and then the, the ice creams by Pharrell. And we built a business around Reebok that changed the brand. It, it made them go from a brand that was relegated to like, third and fourth place right. to something that was aspirational because they were tapping into the culture more uh, by, you know, tapping into these artists and what these artists represented. So how do you go about building a strong, lasting, valuable relationship? In business? Yes. Yeah. You know, I think it's the fundamentals of, of anything, man. You got to do what you say. You got to always do what you say. You can't say anything that you don't mean. Um, and people. So do you under promise and over deliver? No, no. I over promise and over deliver. <laughs> <laughs> so you over promise. You tell people you're going to do something. Yeah. And then you times it. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. You, you push yourself. If I tell you I'm going to do something, it, it means so much to me to live up to my word. I'll ask somebody when I hire them. Six months later, eight months later, did I tell you anything in that interview process that I haven't done? I want to check myself on that. I want to hold the mirror up to myself specifically on that topic because I don't want to use my brain as a weapon and tell you something and be convincing to you and actually have no intent or don't follow through on it. I just think that that's a terrible use of talent. Right. So I do talk about my stretch goals. 
which is the over promise. I'm going to do this. We're going to do this. We do that. But I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a visionary. As a visionary, your job is to see things that before other people see it. Correct. I'm used to being in that uncomfortable place mm -hmm. of seeing something early. So I make those promises and, 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 and I do everything I can to over deliver against that. The funniest thing is that you guys don't get penalized for being wrong. <laughs> being wrong is no problem. All you guys shit it on Jalen Hurts. But he had, but you don't think he's improved? Like he did lose his job at Alabama because he couldn't throw consistently. That's why Tua got the job. Yeah. But, but they thought, but even in the pros, if you look at him from his rookie year to where he is now, he's increased his throw percentage by 10%. That's huge. His accuracy. Yes. Yes. He said 10%? Yes. 10. He was, he was barely, a, he's like in the high 60s mm -hmm. as opposed to the low 60s, 50, the high 50. You don't think that has anything to do with Antonio Brown? AJ. AJ, yeah. Of course. Of course. But you have to understand what did he ha What think about what he had in Alabama. And then what he had at, uh, at Oklahoma. So yeah. yeah, giving him giving him that. But he improved. He put the work in. Yeah. I don't want to shortchange him and just say it's AJ. He put the work in. Yeah. He put a lot of work in. Because you can see him get exponentially better and his confidence grow. There's not that many basketball players that came from Queens. There's some, but not Kenny Anderson. Kenny Anderson, probably Kenny Smith. Yeah. Kenny Smith is from right over here. And we, Kenny's was from uh, Left Rack, which is right over here. Right. Uh, Kenny Anderson's from over here. There's a couple, not like, but not like all the way, not right. all the way. What what place you think is more overrated where football talent comes from? Well, we know it. Well, we know we know Texas and Florida. Texas, yeah. Florida, California, Georgia is right there. Georgia, Florida, California. It's the southern states where the weather is nice. The majority of the time, Louisiana. You mean where people are working, where people are running in the heat? <laughs> you, know, you call it, that nice? It, it, no, that, no, no, no. I'm just saying if that's what you call it, nice. No, it, it needs it needs to be warm. New York, nah, how about hot? New York, New York <laughs> is hot, is hot, okay, or warm more times than it is cold. You're not gonna get. You might get one or two from New York or some cold. Saquon, like Saquon's from New Jersey. Yeah, Mika. Now nah, Saquon, Saquon's Mika. from uh, is he from Aliquippa? He from he from Pennsylvania, isn't he? No, uh, yeah, Pennsylvania. Okay, I'm sorry, that's not the South. No, but I'm saying you. No, I was talking about the South. I was talking about the New York. I'm talking about this area. That's man, all. Man, y'all ain't got no man. Y'all, Michael, talking, hello, Mike, Michael Michael Parsons, 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 yeah. he's from New Jersey. He's from Hasburg. Okay. He's from Hasburg. Bro, the do you do the, you the, do the, you, the, the weather's not nice in these places? Bro, you, like, you just bro. named two places where it's not nice. I'm trying bro, to figure out what you're Y'all got about. like four people in the NFL. Georgia got like 30. California and Texas got like I'm not 50. Even, the, the last thing I'm doing is comparing <laughs> New York football. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we give y'all we give y'all a little basketball problem. But no, no, not a little. I no, mean man. New York basketball. No, 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 no. Y'all used to have that. When y'all had Dr. J, Kareem, and all those guys, it ain't the same no more. Where, where does Kyrie come from? It ain't the same no more. Where does Kyrie come from? Where does Kyrie come from? I mean, it ain't the same. No. It ain't the same. It ain't the same. No, it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> because, what? you know, because now guys, with the guys go, they go to other, they go, I mean, they might be born from here, but, you know, they go now, they go play to Mount Verde, or they go to Oak Hill, and they go to things like that yeah. and finish the IMG Academy and things yeah, like yeah. that nature. Guys are not... Being from an area, playing at a high school, like okay, and, and moving on. That that ain't happening no more. What do you think about the transfer portal mm -hmm. and what it's going to do to college sports? Man, I don't know. If and, you... and, and, and and what do you think? It, and it's right next to that is as much as I'm so for college athletes getting their fair share. Right. LeBron and I. And Maverick did a documentary on this. Did a shut thing on it called uh, "Student Athlete." Right. Um, we followed four student athletes. Man, right. one of them got hurt. No health care. Yeah. Fucked up. The whole thing. But guy walking around campus with five million dollars. Yeah, for sure. Because there's no guarantee. Like you said, he get hurt, and then he can't play in the NFL or he can't play in the NBA. Yeah. Well, he got $5 million. He got a great head start on life. Get it. I wish they didn't get $10 million. But I just saw the uh, the quarterback from Ohio uh, Ohio State and uh, Oklahoma is in the portal. Right now? Yes. Why? The, the starting quarterback? Starting quarterback of Ohio State, starting quarterback from Oklahoma are in the portal. 
looking to get better deals. Yep. Oh, I thought guys were going in the portal because they were not going to start. So they were like, oh, let me go in the portal because what? I can get a better opportunity somewhere else. But if you already started at Ohio State, you started at Oklahoma, where are you going? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to figure out. What are they doing? Money. Somebody go give me an opportunity. Like like Caleb, you don't think Caleb Williams had an opportunity to make money in Oklahoma? But think about what he got at USC. What do you think about him right now? I think he's going to be the number one pick. Uh, can make every throw. He's athletic. Great improvisational skill. Have you spoken to him before? I have not. I'm trying to figure out his head on right. I, I think the thing is, what, what they're going to ask is like, bro, I mean, I think his defense was terrible, but they're going to ask, bro, you that good. I mean, you couldn't win, like, none of these shootouts. But I like him. I think he's going to, I think he's going to really be good. I think there's a lot of quarterbacks in this draft. But it's, it's like anything. I mean, you don't really know. I mean, Brock Purdy was a seventh-round draft pick. The, these guys in the NFL are really not as good as they think they are picking talent. No, 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 no. Because, because it's like anything. It's just like you, you. You picking horses. It don't guarantee your horse gonna win the Derby or the Peakness or the Bell Knox or Santa Anita. You don't know. What do you, what do you think about this whole idea of not even giving these guys a chance to warm up to get their game together, just throwing them out there like that? Because you think that's the right thing to do? Because here's the thing. I know I know they can pay them short money and they can find out. But see, the thing is, is because I need to know by that third year before I give a guy a three hundred million dollar contract. You mean to tell me I got to give a guy three hundred million? I don't know if he can play. They, they don't know. The Giants don't know if their quarterback can play. They paid him. They knew he couldn't play, but what? They didn't have no options. They didn't have to pay Daniel Jones. What are they, they going to go? Go with Tommy DeVito? Now, before we even heard Tommy DeVito, they could have known they weren't going. They didn't have to pay that man one hundred and sixty million dollars. Well, they, they they paid him based on last year. They disregarded all the things that they had done up until that point, and they says, "We well, you know what? We believe this is the guy we're going to get moving forward." They did the same thing with Carson Wentz. Yeah. But Carson, Carson had, you know, Carson was about to be the MVP until he tore his knee up in week 13. He's going to be the MVP. And but it, 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 it's a special type of quarterback that's good, get paid, and then get better. You look at the Brady's, the Manning's, you know, you look at the Patrick Mahomes, you look at those guys, uh, the Rodgers, the, those guys that- Roger. Aaron Rodgers. Oh, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, when he was in Green Bay. Yeah. Get paid, <coughs> excuse me, and get better. Dak? Yeah, Dak, Dak has been very impressive this year. He's been very impressive this year. But- uh, Are you, you know, watching the games? Yeah, I am watching the game. Have you watched? Every single play. Okay. So you watched it for seven, eight years, right? Yeah. So okay, so you know the history, right? Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I yeah. <laughs> he, I have not. He, in big games, I have not seen him. Okay. Against the 49ers two years ago, against the 49ers last year, and a year before that. I said two years ago. That would be they, two years ago. They played. They forty nine to beat them twice, back to back I, years I, I, in the playoffs. I just said two years, last okay. year and the year before. Okay. What about this year, the regular season? Did you see that game, 42-10? Did you watch that game? Yeah. I don't know. I understand why you would turn it off. I didn't understand that game. What you? What didn't you understand? You understand good old-fashioned ass whipping? I don't understand why the defense could not slow them down. I don't know why the deep, Dallas defense got... Well, why your offense couldn't score but 10 points. You just talked that you just talked about I know, Dak. I know, Dak. I know, I know, I know, I know. You just know, told know. me about Dak. The, the Dak CD thing wasn't working back then. It's on fire right now. Okay. We're oh, gonna see him in the playoffs. Um, but yeah, we we now nah, we that was a that that's listen, I'm not I, I don't disagree with you. Dak makes really bad mistakes. I I it's shocking to me sometimes he shocking though. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even like Brock Purdy. I, it's not about like or dislike. I got to evaluate a guy on what I've seen. Kind of like I, him now. I need I need to see more consistency. You making your girl? You make, he's one. He's you, one. You making your, you making a, uh, you making a chick your girl after after a couple of dates? No. Oh, you want to see? You want some consistency? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what yeah. I'm saying. 
You think Justin Fields, they can get a third round pick for him? <laughs> yeah, I think they get more than a third. Then they're in great shape then. Yeah. They're in great shape. Would you trade him? I would. I don't I don't believe me personally. I don't believe they're going to pass up the uh, chance. Well, yeah, I don't think they're going to pa- they would pass up because it looks like they're going to get Carolina. They have Carolina's yeah, number pick, one pick. Yeah, yeah. And they're going to have their own. Pick, yeah, that's first and four. So, and with Justin Fields, if I can get me a, 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 qua, a, a top-notch veteran player, because there are a lot of teams that's going to need quarterbacks. I just think Justin Fields needs a change of scenery. Yeah. I don't think he's a bad quarterback. Neither do I. I just think he needs a change of scenery in Chicago. Indy? They got where they just drafted a Richardson with the fourth pick oh, in the draft. Right. He got hurt. That's right. That's right. He was playing good, too. But, uh, let me see who. who. The uh, the Raiders could use a quarterback. You don't think the Raiders could use Hell a quarterback? Yeah. Pittsburgh could use a quarterback. They don't want to agree with that yet. Um, They're still in denial about that kid. Who? Pickett. Man, please. The fans about to start picketing. I'm going to ask you a question that's separate of the topic. Okay. When you got to Baltimore. Yes. And you seen Ed and Ray. Ed wasn't there when I was there. He came after you? He came after me. He came after I had went back to Denver. Oh, so you never got a chance to play with him. I never got to play. I played against him. I didn't play with him. You played him against him when you were in Denver? Yes. Have you ever seen anybody like that? No. No. He's the greatest safety ever. I played against, took off on film. He's phenomenal. Payne Manning tells stories. He told a story on the 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 the, the Manning cast. The, not the Manning cast. He told a story on when the NFL did the hundred greatest. Oh, yeah, yeah. He told a story, but oh, I Ed picked him. Ed picked him. He well, Ed Ed hid in the shadows of uh, Lucas Stadium in the oil and Lucas Oil Stadium he, that he couldn't count him. He couldn't he couldn't find him on the he couldn't find him in a pre snap read, and that was. Oh, he told me that story live. Right. That he couldn't find him, and he he he, he, he couldn't find him in a pre. Wasn't the other safety white? I'm not. When I'm Ed not, was there, it was a white safety. It was a, yeah, yeah. Because he, he told the story that he could see that guy, but he couldn't find Ed. He couldn't know where Ed was, and Ed was squatting in the shadows, almost like he knew where the shadow was, and he couldn't <laughs> fucking find him. Then he told the story where Ed he, he fooled Ed fooled him that on was, the, the post corner. That, that was in Baltimore, and Ed. Ed, what he did, it was that Peyton looked him off, and Ed pretend like he was gonna drop one side and dip turn around, and yeah, and took off line and picked the ball off from uh, Reggie Wayne. Yeah, you have to. It's, it's one of the greatest plays that you'll ever see, and you have to understand what he did and how he did it to fool that guy, because Peyton just knew he had him dead to right, like I got him, and, and probably Peyton. You seen the play? I saw the play. I saw the play at the time that it happened, and it was the, like, I'm like, how, why? There was no, there was no indication that he should have done what he did. And how about Ray? Ray was a student of the game. He was ferocious. He loved the game of football. He put time in it to be great. He worked hard. He was a student. He's very disciplined. I spent time with him. I, I love hanging out with him. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually going to Ni- Zamunda. I'm going to Nigeria oh, yeah. uh, next week. Yeah, we we are opening up United Masters in, in La- Lagos, Nigeria. I wow. can't wait to go. I wow. can't wait to go. Um, I'm really excited about it. Uh, the independent music scene in Nigeria right. and uh, South America, specifically Colombia right. and Argentina, is going crazy. Wow. Because yeah. all these people, they don't know of record companies. Right. They just know, make music, Get it out, right. and That's perfect, they're writing. You they're writing monster hits. Right. Yeah, but except these songs are becoming number one records. Wow, they're not. They're not. They're not just like regional songs. Right, they're becoming global, impactful, monster number one records. Wow. Jay mentioned you in a song. Think you get Jay to put me in a song? I want to be in a song, man. I ain't never been no song. Man, you don't need to I ain't been no video. I ain't been nothing, man. You hot you already. Got a cool life, man. Nah, you hot already. You crazy? You don't need to be in no song. I don't man. Need a song. 
Shannon I Sharp. Wait, I will wait. Somebody reference. Somebody said Shannon Sharp and something. <laughs> I'm sure if I Google Shannon Sharp in the song, I'll find some I shit. Had, I hated those songs, bro. Steve, I want to thank you for bringing me to your office, of course, showing me bro. around Queens. I really appreciate it. Continued success. Yeah. Steve Stout, ladies and gentlemen. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice? Got to roll the dice. That's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Look, all my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice? Got to roll the dice. That's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life.